Yeah, so from this speaker, we have Felix uh, of Council. Thank you very much. Um, I'm here to basically expand on what Conrad just talked about and take intense one level um, further, uh, basically beyond kind of the use case that we see today, swap intents, and um, how we achieve this uh, on at Cloud Protocol with the introduction of a recent feature uh, that's, that's called Books. Maybe just um, to get everyone in the room on the same page, uh, this event's called Event WTF, so probably everyone is, is here just staying to what the fuck are event intents. Um, intents are just fan fancy word for living, right? And well, of course this is not the case, but in a way the um, whole hype around intents I think started with uh, limit swap orders, swap intents. Um, and in a way, it was back the first and probably the still until today the most strongest use case for where intents actually made sense. And we had Cal Protocol where uh, I think in 2019 started to um, release the first version of an exchange that allows users to kind of uh, trade in, in, in terms of intents, uh, abstract swap limit orders. Um, and I wanted to just quickly go back to like what our thought process was um, at that time. Um, also then you know, preparing for the actual design of Cloud Protocol, which went fully um, focused on intents and why we thought it made sense um, compared to uh, users sending like <coughs> specific uh, swap transactions into the network. Um, when we launched, EIP 1559 was not even a thing, so kind of the TLDR of the slide is just transaction management is very hard. And in 2020, 2021, this was even more true because you would have to decide what is the correct gas price to set, and gas prices were extremely volatile, and uh, now with EFD1559, you only have to really decide on the tip, which is much easier, because yeah, usually a one to three GUA tip is, is, is sufficient. Uh, but even beyond just transaction management, um, if you're making a swap, one of the fundamental problems for you as a user is how do I get best execution? And that's actually a really, really tough problem for retail users to achieve. Um, because, well, mainly prices are very volatile and blockchains operate in these discrete time intervals, um, blocks that, that happen at the cost of this. So uh, let's unpack that a little bit. Um, you know, prices are very volatile, which means that um, you see a price on the Uniswap UI, you click swap, but then 12 seconds later it ends up in actually being mined in a block and the price <coughs> has changed because other people are trading the same asset at the same time. So in order for you to make your trade go through, you actually have to tell the UI that I'm fine if the price moves against me uh, with some certain slippage tolerance. Now, if you do that properly and trade a very volatile token and set a large slippage tolerance, you then open up yourself to um, NEV extraction, where even if the price doesn't move against you, somebody that observes your now very lax limit order can take it and basically manipulate the price from any swap to front run you um, execute you at your slippage tolerance, at your limit price, and then back on you to risk-free and atomically extract value. So then you might go ahead and say, okay, let me just uh, set a very tight slippage tolerance. Um, but even then, you might not get test execution just because uh, if you're making a large trade. It's likely that you don't want to um, execute that trade just on a single pool. You might want to route it and split it across uh, many DeFi venues. And the optimal split and optimal route also depends on you know, the state of the block. So as time moves on, as the state changes, the route that was optimal when you saw maybe the, the computation in, in Paraswap or, or one inch if you're using a bet surrogator is no longer the optimal route when your trade actually gets executed. Um, and this becomes even, even more of a problem if you are not, if you're a security concern, uh, com security aware user and you're not using EOA for your major swaps, you're using a multi-signature account like SAFE, you have multiple signers that you need to use in order to actually authorize that transaction. Then you'll have one point in time where you're proposing your trade transaction, and then another point in time where you've collected all the signatures and your transaction will actually make it on chain. And that time difference, again, will make it very hard for you to get optimal execution because prices are volatile and change. And now if you're an institution and you have people around the globe that need to sign, your delay comes up to maybe a couple of hours. If you're a DAO that actually goes through a vote, your delay may even be a couple of days. So getting optimal execution is extremely hard. And the second uh, drawback that we saw at the time was um, still true today, especially with the way the gut prices again, is that retail users have to do all this complex stuff, and if they mess up, they have a pretty high cost. Because if the transaction fails, they pay bad transaction costs that, that can, you know, in bull market times, be a multiple hundred dollars per transaction. 
for achieving nothing. And back in the days, we ran a study that actually showed 15% of DEX aggregator trades and, and more than 15% of Uniswap trades were failing at the time, causing a lot of harm and uh, loss, execution loss to the users. So what we, what we basically built with Cloud Protocol was uh, a delegated trade execution system, which you know, is pretty much the definition of intense. Uh, instead of the user explicitly saying how they want to achieve their trade by signing a transaction and giving it to the miner and asking them to go to Uniswap and copying that exact trade, the user on Cloud Protocol just signs a message saying, I want to swap this asset for that asset and hands that off to a professional third party, a solver like Enzo, and um, basically has that professional party uh, optimized and you know, handle all the complexities that, that we've seen on the, on the previous slide. Um, to summarize some of the advantages and disadvantages of this approach, um, of course the advantages probably outweigh uh, the, the drawbacks, uh, but basically by handing off just this abstract intent <coughs> to a solver, the trader does not commit to a concrete execution path on chain. I think mean, that's, the, that's the key part. That decision is put as late in the cycle as possible. Even within the 12 second block time, the solver can decide to just you know, 100 milliseconds before the block gets picked by the proposer, commit to what is the best execution path for this um, trade in this route, in this, in this block. And if the solver for whatever reason made a mistake and the, the transaction reverted, uh, they could go ahead and in the next block try again with different, or even in the same block try multiple routes and uh, make it so that the builder would only pick uh, one of the one of the main. And so you know we, we really have like complete flexibility and um, defer that optimal trade execution finding to the latest possible stage. For the trader, the user experience um, advantage is that they only pay the fee if their trade actually goes through. They outsource the reversion risk to that professional party. And um, another really nice user um, experience benefit is that the way that they pay their network fee equivalent back to the solver can be in any token. It doesn't have to be in the native ETH uh, currency, so you don't need to, as a user, be uh, stacked with some token that, you know, ETH that, that doesn't necessarily relate to the trades that you're doing. If you're selling some shitcoin, then you can also pay your network fee attention. Um, there are a few drawbacks. This clicker is not working super well. But um, I think back in the day, one of the main drawbacks that we had was convincing integrations, users, and people to actually switch to this new paradigm, just because people are kind of conservative by nature and you know, oh, we've always signed transactions, let's keep on signing transactions. Uh, with the rise of other intent-based systems, uh, such as Uniswap X and One Inch Fusion, we've kind of you know gotten to the point where now people see, okay, intents out of the future, let's move towards that way. Uh, but there's still like technical um, drawback that I'd like to mention around um, the gas costs for intents are slightly higher than, at least in most cases, than uh, if the user executed that intent you know, natively by themselves. And that's mainly because uh, we have to do an extra signature verification step in um, the smart contract that is basically executing um, the intent. And this is because in the, the traditional model, basically the fact that the user is okay with what's happening ha happens as part of the general Ethereum-based protocol transaction verification. They're looking at the EOA of the user and has they, have they signed this, this transaction. Uh, of course, this happens in intent-based systems as well, but there the uh, message px.origin is the solver. And so we need to have an additional signature verification to actually make sure that the solver is doing something that the user uh, was, was fine with. But we can actually overcome this drawback in the way that uh, Cloud Protocol has implemented intents, which is um, not just executing intents individually by, uh, sequentially by one another, but actually enabling or opening um, what we call batch auctions to collect multiple trade intents for the same block, putting them all together into a, a single batch, having a decentralized solver network to compete for the right to execute the batch, and then settling not just a single intent, but multiple trade intents in the same uh, Ethereum transaction. And so with batch auctions, we have um, mainly, I guess, only advantages. Uh, the, the main advantage we get from not just executing intents individually, but in, in batches is that um, we can match people directly with one another peer to peer. And that's what we are calling coincidence of wants, cars. That's where the name Cloud Protocol is coming from. It's basically if you want to sell an asset that I want to buy, 
um, and the asset that you are wanting to buy it happens to be the asset that I also want to sell, then you know, have a coincidence of wants. We want the exact opposite thing and can trade two. In this case, we don't have to um, pay a market maker or LP fee to the uh, protocol that we would otherwise go to to trade. We don't have to pay uh, price impact. We're not moving the price up and back down again. So we overall get a structural price improvement that you're not getting on any other decentralized exchange protocol today. On top of that, cows make your uh, trades fundamentally uh, NED proof because you're kind of agreeing with the other person, okay, this is the price that we'll trade against one another peer to peer, and you're not relying on any kind of publicly available liquidity source such as Uniswap, then there's nobody that can come in for you and snipe away the price that Uniswap is offering and kind of come back after you to like trade sandwich you in a way. Uh, it doesn't matter, uh, you're not depending on any of these like snipeable public um, liquidity sources. So if uh, the settlement can be in the first slot in the block, in the middle of the block, or at the end of the block, the execution doesn't matter. Uh, so coincidence of wants to be fundamentally um, reduce the amount of energy that you're exposing. But even if there's not um, you know, a coincidence of one just by the simple fact that you're handing off execution to the solvers, you are reducing the effective MEV that you're likely going to expose as a retail user dramatically just because solvers are much more uh, sophisticated. The uh, drawback that we saw on the previous slide, um, gas overhead, is amortized by the fact that we can now uh, put multiple intents into the same transaction. So we can share the 20,000 gas that a year in charges for each transaction as a base fee, but also if two um, swaps access the same Uniswap pool, for instance, the cost for trading against the pool is amortized across swaps, making it more gas efficient. And then the last thing that batch auctions allow is um, we can impose additional fairness guarantees on the execution of swaps. And one of the fairness guarantees that Cow Protocol is, um, you know, very, uh, that, that's very important to us, is we want to have a uniform clearing price. If two people trade the same asset within the same block, there's no reason that they should be matched at different prices. Um, because blocks just get emitted at a single instant in time. There's no guarantee first come, first served. It's all kind of arbitrarily ordering by the proposer or block builder. So there's no good reason why people that end up trading the same asset as the same block should be trading at a different price. Now, this is not possible in the traditional model because every Ethereum transaction kind of needs to be executed sequentially, so you cannot kind of impose uh, these uniform price clearing constraints on it. But in a batch, you can say that, well, if the intent is on the same token pair, it needs to be executed at the same time. And this, again, in our mind, fundamentally reduces energy, not just kind of trying to help you to make less mistakes, but really, um, if there's just a single price per token per block, there's no way how a builder could rearrange or um, you know, take advantage of buying an asset low and reselling it at a higher price or new block, because there's just one price. And so we think that this is like one of the strongest um, positions and ways of how we can fundamentally reduce MEV on chain and make uh, rent extraction protocols or infrastructure um, less harmful and, and maybe even overall less uh, One more kind of detail about how the batch auction and cow protocol work is that we are not only looking at each token pair and kind of seeing uh, who wants to buy and sell on that exact token pair. We actually aggregate all intents into a multi-dimensional batch auction which then allows us to also find coincidence of ones in multiple dimensions and what we call ring trades. So even if in this example, nobody is trading the exact buy and sell token of the other person, we can still pair up the four traders um, and you know, execute them as uh, what is called a ring trade. And this is particularly powerful on Ethereum today because here we see two tokens involved are DAI and USDT, represent the same underlying asset, the US dollar. And then we're seeing this kind of Cambrian explosion of tokens, this fragmentation of liquidity, the same asset being represented with multiple underlying tokens, um, which makes it you know, very hard to fragment liquidity. It's kind of bad for the user. Um, and so by batching the entire aggregate demand and supply for all tokens into a single auction, we can re-aggregate that, that fragment liquidity and make it um, better for, for more efficient for people to trade. This was kind of a recap on what Cow Protocol is, <laughs> how we got into intents. Today I mainly want to talk about how we go beyond just swap intents and augment what the user can express 
um, to basically anything, uh, any intent that, that, that you think uh, people may have. In order to look at hooks, it's extended intents. Let's first look at the basic life of a power order and what happens in the system when it operates. Um, here, for simplicity, we just assume there's a single leader in the batch, um, and so there's no coincidence at once. Um, their execution happens with some on-chain liquidity and is kick-started by uh, the solver. Uh, so the first thing that happens in our settlement conflict is that we verify the signature of the trade intent, making sure that the user is actually willing to, to make the swap that the, the, the solver uh, proposes or says they would. We then transfer in the sell tokens so that we have something to work with, something to um, convert into the buy token. The solver then has, with um, their initiation of the settlement, also provided us with, you could call it a recipe of how the trade should be executed on chain, a list of on chain interactions, um, DeFi protocols, private market makers, things to fall into to convert the sell token into the buy token. Uh, those interactions are executed and eventually the uh, buy tokens are transferred over to the user uh, and the trade is completed. Now, if we look at a hooked cow order, it's pretty much exactly the same. We're still making a swap, but we allow the user now to specify arbitrary interactions, if you will, before and after uh, the settlement is executed. So the very first thing we do is we call a bunch of um, user-specified free hooks I go into the next slide to show exactly how the flow of a free hook works. Uh, but the idea there is that the free hook can enable the, the swap. It could pull in funds from some DeFi protocol where you have a stake. It could um, set an allowance that is needed to make a, a, a swap happen. Basically, anything that needs to happen before your swap can go through, uh, you can specify in a free hook. And then similarly, if you want to clean up after yourself, uh, after the trade, if you want to use the PC, bridge them over to some other chain or put them into some um, staking protocol, you can do that in a post token. So before and after your trade, you can now do uh, arbitrary calls, which lifts the intent expression language that Cow Protocol supports to a new Um Just the way that completely on the hooks uh, flow is, is it's a little bit technical, um, but basically the settlement contract holds a bunch of um, state and allowances, so we don't want users to kind of execute their hooks in the context of the um, Cow Protocol settlement contract. That is um, only up for solvers who have who are posting a bond and are you know able to get slashed if something like just happens. We don't want traders to have to post a bond in order to use Cow Protocol. So what we do is we first um, switch the caller contracts, just call into a, a very dumb uh, multi-send contract that we call the trampoline, which has no allowances, no no um, no state, um, and then that contract calls into your target hook just to make it. You know, and, and secure. Um, if you're wondering how you as a developer or you know, tech-savvy user can specify a hook within your Cow Protocol order, it's actually quite simple. Um, if you've ever signed a uh, Cow order with MetaMask, you might have come across this app data field, which looks like a very gibberish 32 bytes um, string. What it actually is, is a pointer to a file that is hosted on IP address, and that file can have you know, arbitrary metadata about your uh, swap intent. And so what we've added are these fields, um, hooks, it's a list of pre and a list of post hooks, which uh, the user can specify the target contract, the call data, and the gas limit, and then upload the file with the hooks for their order up to IPFS, which would give them an IPFS hash. And if they spay that, specify that hash with the um, app data that they sign, also to authorize the, the hooks, uh, the protocol will automatically pick them up and, and execute. It's quite simple, quite, quite nice to, to add hooks to your trades. Um, and we have also a full step-by-step um, -step Ethers.js tutorial on our docs.cloud.py page that walk you through how to add a hook list when linked to uh, Now I want to go through a few use cases for hooks. How can they be useful in practice? Um, some of which we have already implemented. Um, on the free hook side, one way we can use um, hooks is well, generally to prepare your trade. Um, one specific edge case for intent-based systems is when people are trying to trade the native asset ETH on, on Ethereum, uh, which is not really possible through intents today uh, because you need, for intents generally, you need to allow the solver to kind of work with the funds on your behalf. And since Ether is the native token, you cannot really set an allowance for it. You cannot 
allow somebody to pull out either from your contract, and therefore, um, usually you have to wrap it into the ERC20 version, which is wrapped either um, for any trades possible. Now, this used to make it a very annoying, like, three-step process uh, to trade uh, Ether, but we've recently kind of deployed a native ETH flow, which allows uh, users to kind of wrap ETH natively before the trade happens, and, and that you know, is, is one of the examples where clear is useful. Uh, the second example is another step that you needs to be done before you trade. We execute it, setting an allowance. It's the second uh, step that, that needs to happen before you can swap. And um, there are some more modern ERC20 tokens that allow setting allowances via a permit signature. And those permit signatures can also be uh, executed as part of the um, as part of the queen. So now on Cosmos specifically, you can go and, um, for example, have an account that has no ether just gets funded with UCC, you uh, sign a permit for the UCC, you sign a swap for the UCC, and our protocol will completely gaslessly uh, convert that into some other token you might care about, or even bridge it to another chain where you have your main uh, kind of DeFi activity. A third use case, which is not yet implemented, um, we are uh, sponsoring a grant at the um, hackathon this week, so if you're uh, interested in, in, in building, you know, Talk to me afterwards. We're like, super happy to have to see if we build more stuff on top of Carbox. Uh, but one idea here would be to um, enable a trade by, for instance, unstaking an NLP position um, or something else, maybe withdrawing from a from a, a maker position or yeah, unwinding a loan in some way. Uh, that basically is a prerequisite for your trade to go through. Um, the last idea here is, is is even more technical and and a bit more kind of uh, exotic. With this would be to deploy. Uh, the smart contract that is making the trade just in time. So you could theoretically have a, an empty address. And, uh, it looks like an empty address before the settlement contract, before the settlement goes through. And in the pre work you're kind of just in time deploying the safe that is going to be at that address and it implements like some programmatic order, which you know could be a TWAP order or a stop loss order or uh, something else. Again, very technical. We can talk about it kind of uh, in more detail, but. The, the, the just wanted to show here that kind of the use cases for this are somewhat um, endless. On the post hook side, um, I think the most common one is bridging assets after you've traded onto another chain. Uh, this has been prototyped by the Polygon team. It's good to have this to uh, you know, make the chain agnostic and have it to be able to bridge to any other chain. Uh, and another example would be to restake your LP tokens. Uh, for instance, if you want to um, harvest some yield and go back into that LP position and then restake it, uh, you could do that as a post hook as well. So yeah, just to summarize kind of what do hooks allow you, uh, they allow to connect your swap intents with anything else you might want to do before or after you trade. Um, there's a few gotchas, I don't know how much time I have, they're also somewhat technical, so I might just go through them very quickly. Um, one is about the, the order context, this trampoline contract that we talked uh, about, kind of just Keep in mind that if, for instance, the trader is in a new A, you might need some form of account abstraction to actually allow that um, trampoline con context to do something on behalf of the trader. You should be careful to not leave any balances or allowances in this trampoline. I think right now there's about $30. Somebody left $30 in the trampoline contract, so if somebody wants some lunch money, go ahead and, and, and take it out. Uh, if you're building a hook, make sure to not leave anything behind. Um, there's some limitations as to what you can do with hooks. Like we had some people asking, oh, can I take out a flash loan and then uh, use that proceeds to trade and then pay it back afterwards? This unfortunately is not possible because we have to kind of yield back to the settlement contract to do the trade before we can execute the post hook. So um, again, kind of technical. And uh, the last thing is maybe um, more grasp, more easy to grasp is that um, every hook specifies a gas limit that um, it's uh, allowed to, be, to use. And uh, this gas limit is also converted into the sell token and charged as a network fee uh, from the user. And so if you're developing hooks, just make sure that um, that gas limit is well estimated. Um, if you overestimate it, then the user may pay too much. If you underestimate it, uh, the hook may run out of gas and not execute. Um, but you know, generally, it's fairly simple to build. And you know, we're hoping that we can get some people excited to build on this this weekend. Even Dan Robinson from Paradigm is super excited and wants to see uh, what people are building on hooks. Um, I think, unfortunately, he was talking about sleeping four hooks here, but uh, you don't need to wait for your sleeping four hooks because castle hooks are already live in production and you can start building on them today. Thank you.